welcome everyone to episode 28 of Top of Mind with Concilio Wealth. On today's episode, we are going to talk about higher interest rates on cash. Uh, those aren't permanent, but they are really, really attractive right now. You can earn four, five, five over 5% five on high yield accounts right now. Um, interesting news in earnings that specifically we're going to focus on General Mills and what General Mills earnings says about inflation. Uh, Topic number three is about inflation. Uh, CPI came out and it was good news. And finally, there was a very interesting article that we saw that said Americans haven't felt this good about the economy in two years. You might remember if you've been a listener of ours for a while, uh, about a month, month and a half ago, we commented on consumer confidence and how it relates to the stock market and consumer confidence has now jumped. So we thought we would unpack that for you today. As always, I am joined by Mr. Hao Dang and uh, had the pleasure of seeing Hao in person last week. He was was in town. We're in the same city. So it was great to catch up with you live. And uh, let's see here. Where should we start, Hao? Well, it's great to be back. Uh, When we were in Seattle, it was low 80s most of the time. Pretty nice. Yeah, it's a good time of year. (laughs) And I came back, it was 108 degrees here in Sacramento. It's We're getting a little bit of a break. It's only 103 today. Oh, yeah, nice. But the heat wave has been punishing. Does it cool down overnight, though? Do you get like down to the no. 70s, and, or does it stay stay hot? It stays hot, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize it was so hot down there. Yeah, it's seemingly getting more hot. Because I, I was... Uh, raised here as a kid and i think the highest we've again going off memory so it's not reliable i think i recall not having consistently 108 for <clears throat> lo- through all throughout my entire childhood here yeah i feel like seattle has uh we've gotten more extreme you know it snows every year didn't do that as a kid um it gets pre- pretty hot like it used to get warm in the summer but you know, we'll touch 100 a couple times. I guess we haven't this year yet. But what was it, two years ago when we got to 108 degrees? And yeah, I heard that. Sauna outside. Yeah. So uh, I, don't know if, I don't know if our weather is improving or just getting more extreme. Uh, maybe we're getting more extreme rain and that kind of thing. We'll see. <laughs> All right, let's start off with higher rates. So uh, there's a lot of... When cash is paying 5% or somewhere around there, it's hard to not just take that and instead go take risk and, and go into the stock market. Yeah. So I know you had some some insights here and some data. We just wanted to unpack, you know, high rates on cash aren't permanent and, and just, you know, let, let's let's talk through this for a moment. Yeah, um, I, don't, I lost the exact data, but the the higher rates has attracted quite a bit of new money, not new money, but money that had been sitting around either in savings accounts or even the stock market, right? And as you alluded to, Chris, where, where that 5% just seems, you're going to look at that in a in a vacuum. Mm-hmm. And that's all you see is 5% return, right? Mm-hmm. It's always it's always the question of relative to what and for how long. Um, with savings rates, even in the height of the 80s high rate regime, those rates eventually came down, right? Um, Paul Volcker raised rates to, I believe, 19, 20%. And then with, over the next year, they came down. Again, 10%. It's still half, but you were no longer getting 20% returns on your on your cash. And mortgage rates flipped on that where, you know, mortgage rates were 15, 20% hmm. for home prices. Mm-hmm. So, so higher rates aren't a forever thing. I don't think they're meant to be at this in this type of economy anymore where the Fed will see they're sufficiently slowing down. At least that's what inflation is, data is showing. Mm-hmm. And there may be a day sooner than what we all expect um, where rates go down, right? Does 8% mortgage rates in this environment make sense? I think in this environment, yes, but housing yeah. is at a gridlock, right? Because mm-hmm. are you putting your house on the market? I know I we talked about our mortgage rates when I was up there. I was at 3%. Mm-hmm. There's no way 
I would trade up or even down at this point because we can't give give up a 3% mortgage in exchange for an 8%. Can I challenge your point? Yeah, go ahead. So going along with your thesis, thesis of saying that rates will come down eventually and knowing that the housing market is, from what I'm reading, still kind of crazy but softer than it was, Yeah. why wouldn't it be a not necessarily better, but still an okay time to buy because you can buy with more, you know, maybe at a lower price, maybe you can have contingencies, whereas, you know, the market we're all used to a year ago and so or so, you know, you had to go in and wave everything. So why yeah. wouldn't it be a decent time to still buy stomach six, 7% on a mortgage for a while, knowing that it will come down at some point, probably not to three, by the way, but it will, it will come down. So What's your yeah, they can refinance, that? right? And I think that's a really logical challenge. And I think that's what the Fed was thinking when they raised rates was housing prices would come down. They didn't. I don't think they anticipated the lack of supply coming online hmm. because of that reason, right? Because when someone moves out of a home, they most likely will want, want to move into a new home. Sure. And if that exchange is so prohibit, prohibitive that, that you're not willing to sell your existing home, the the number of supply of homes has come down but if you look at home builders they're they're raking it in because they're the only ones with any kind of inventory available new homes yeah, yeah new homes and they can't build those fast enough and i think that's what the conundrum that we're in it's this weird thing that logically yes your approach makes makes sense and i think that's what the fed assumed but that's not what we're getting I see what you're saying. You're saying if, if let's say that the mortgage rates can go to five, five is, or, th you know, four that's, and a half, right? It feels normal. It's, I don't know what's normal, but it feels normal, right? Well, and let's just say that that's more normal than say eight. mid sixes or seven, or even, yeah. even if it, if it's eight, I mean, I, I've seen some reports that it's that high, but I, I don't think that actual rates, I was looking at that and I was looking at rates that people were actually paying and it's more yeah. like six and a half from what I can see. So if anybody knows that better than I do, you know, feel free to shoot us an email. Would love, would love some actual insights there. But your point is if rates were to come down, even though that it would be higher than your current 3% locked rate, you might be more incentivized at that point to switch. Therefore more inventory hits the, hits the market because the people who own homes at low rates are selling because they're yeah. upsizing or changing location or whatever. Yeah. Or it's either that or prices have to come down. And then that's another conundrum, right? If prices come down, my selling price will come down. Then all of a sudden I have less money to spend on a new home at higher interest rates. So it's I always mean, this weird, yeah. That's the conundrum really, too, right? How yeah. far, if rates keep, keep going up, how far do prices have to come down on the next house to convince somebody like you to sell the current house to buy the next house and stomach yeah. the higher rate, right? Like yeah. if it's, is it 9% and now another 10% comes off the house price or something like there's a number, right? It's a math problem. Everything's a math problem. Yeah. Um, I agree with you. It'd be difficult to get rid of a low mortgage um, rate, but at some, at some point there might be kind of that, like that long-term thinking might kick in and overwhelm the short-term interest rate. Oh, I see what you're getting. If you pl if you do plan it out properly, the the introductory interest rate probably shouldn't matter. Mm -hmm. But it could make the month to month affordable legal mortgage payments that much bigger, and yep. affordability short term might be pretty painful, especially yep. if in a years to, in my case, thirteen hundred dollar mortgage. It has to. Let's say you have to go to three thousand. That's a big, big adjustment, mm -hmm. but. Yeah, if you do plan it out and think about it longer term, that moment where you are able, when and when and if that happens to refinance, I think that would be a pretty good thing. And you're in the house you wanted to be in. But yeah, potentially for less than it than it was potentially, or yeah. will be if rates come down. Yeah. Let me bring us back. I, I totally went into housing, you're, you're here trying to talk about short-term cash rates and I started talking about <laughs> housing. So, um, let's come back to, to, you know, high yield savings account, short-term bonds, that kind of thing. Yeah. So as soon as the rate cuts do happen for whatever reason, um, most likely is because inflation is tame. We'll get to inflation of what happened, but if that were the, the case, 
we are going to see lower rates than what we're seeing, 5.5%, uh, upwards of almost 6%, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. But there will be some stimulative push right from the Fed where the economy may has slowed down sufficiently. Uh, inflation's gone away. Let's normalize rates. Maybe this is normal, but I don't see... I don't see that being persistent. We've gotten so many questions in the last couple of months on high yield savings accounts. You know, people that keep just a regular amount of cash in their Chase account or their BECU account, not making anything on it. And we're getting emails saying, hey, what what should I do? And our typical reply to that is, yeah, we like high yield savings accounts. We also like money market accounts. Money markets are paying more than high yield accounts right now. Yep. Um, could be because of the, they don't have FDIC insurance and there's still a little bit of a, I think just with all the banking stuff in the news, people are still a little concerned about that and, and, and that's fine. Um, we are typically pointing people to Google, you know, high yield savings accounts and watch out for um, teaser rates. Teaser rates are the ones that say you have to make an automatic deposit take a withdrawal, go to an ATM and stand on one hand in order to get this rate. Otherwise you get that rate. Yep. We don't like those accounts because they're trying to get all your banking and all you're trying to do is get short term, you know, short term rates. So yeah. uh, typically we're finding people are saying good things about Amex high yield savings and then uh, Marcus, which is a Goldman Sachs product. Uh, there are other options out there too. That's those aren't the only two, but we seem to be hearing good things about those two. Yeah, and assuming we started the year at 5.5%, you break that down, um, you are getting, let's say, 1% a quarter. Um, sure. That's a big assumption because I know we started the year at 3.5%, so I know anyone in high-yield savings is not going to get 5% at the end of the year, mm-hmm. right? And so far this year, you've gotten 2.5%. Yep. Right? Compared yep. To, that, to the stock market, I know this is different buckets, but the stock market is up 18.87%. Plus, you know, and you have dividends that are most likely keeping up in, yeah. in pace of your high yield savings rate at this point. It's a good point. Yeah. Well, and if you invested with your emotions, or rather, if 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 uh, if you didn't invest with your emotions and you put money in high yield because five percent sounds pretty good with no risk, you missed the eighteen and change percent of the the market this yeah. year. Diversified yeah. portfolio isn't isn't quite that high because you might own some bonds, you might own some, you know, some small cap, which hasn't done quite as well. But um, I think our listeners get what we're saying there. Yeah. And we're not trying to build out uh, fear of missing out here. It's just, if that was your, your stock money that was supposed to be invested in equities. Yeah. I think that's where we're trying to spotlight. Not yeah. if this is a uh, mortgage money or bill, you know, pay the bill money. 5% is more than sufficient. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I want to wrap on one point and, and we'll come back to how good consumers feel potentially because the stock market's doing <laughs> well, but uh, I want to wrap on one point. So high yield savings accounts. The other thing that we're, we're telling clients is, is money market accounts. Um, if you have say like a fidelity account or a Schwab account, um, just check what the default cash position is. The default cash position in retail fidelity accounts is almost always F cash, like F cash. Uh, that thing only pays like two and a half. And so it's kind of a bummer that that's the default. You can click about three buttons and change your default to a fund that pays 4.75. Just Google that, like Google F cash. Um, you know, you'll see, you'll see the fund options and, and yep. again, feel free to reach out to us too, and we can help you with it, but change your default cash option in any of your fidelity accounts. Um, you can even, if you're a client of ours, look into the, the accounts with us and see what we hold cash in, um, that, you know, actually, I don't know if that's an option on the retail side of Fidelity. We are independent. Um, we custody through Fidelity, but we are an independent wealth management firm. So we are not affiliated with Fidelity. However, our clients' investments are custody. Yeah, uh, at Fidelity. If you do have to purchase it, it's it's the money market government fund. <laughs> and it's it's Fidelity's easiest to access fund. Yeah. Oh, and I remember why we put that on there is um, I know our theme has always been don't assume short-term events are trend, right? Mm-hmm. That they're going to continue on the way they are. Um, I think that's what the, at least some of the, the responses I'm getting of cash is always going to pay that. Again, it's it's not a permanent thing. It's not going to go on forever. Like, like I-bonds, 
I think we, we've been saying <laughs> I-bonds will not continue to pay in uh, high rates as long as inflation continues to go down. We've been seeing that trend since really, honestly, the last summer of 2022. Yep. So this is not something we've suddenly started saying because CPI came in lower. We've go back. We've been saying I-bonds will continue to lower their yields. And even when we um, started uh, educating everyone on I-bonds, we said eventually those those yields will come down because inflation doesn't won't stick around forever. Yep. Yep. Okay, let's move to General Mills earnings. What happened in their earnings report and what does this say about the economy and inflation? Yeah, not the most exciting company to talk about, but I thought that was insightful with the CEO said. So I'm going to read this verbatim. The carrying cost of inventory is higher. Interest rates are up, meaning those boxes of cereal take up space, right? Warehouse space, we've talked about uh, mm -hmm. the, the big inventory glut of last year. I, I don't know if everyone remembers Crocs or Yeti holding a ton of excess inventory. I do. It's happening with General Mills. Um, uh, their, in parentheses, their big customers, i.e. Walmart, Target, grocery stores, are trying to work their balance sheets, right? Meaning General Mills cereals aren't flying those shelves. And Target, Walmart aren't really lowering the prices to get those boxes moved out. And customers at the same time are trading down. They're going to the white label, hmm. which I think this is a conundrum that these big companies have put themselves in, where they've they've enjoyed higher inflation, mm -hmm. and they raise their prices in response, right? Mm -hmm. And now they're more reluctant to lower prices. We so, talked about eggs too, right? <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> and how persistent the grocery store is about not lowering their prices on eggs. So I think what. I'm hearing here is General Mills raised their prices because of supply chain and, and just, sure. you know, cost yep. of things. Then grocery stores raised prices in order to protect margins and to reflect the cost and of goods that they're buying. buying. Yeah, people were buying at the time. General Mills now has been able to lower the cost of producing their product because supply chain is eased and the, the cost of things can go down, inflation has come down, but grocery stores have not yet lowered their prices and that's what's now keeping that inventory sitting on the shelves and therefore then target isn't placing another order for Cheerios. Yeah. I guess I don't know if that's a general mills product. That is. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> for Cheerios because they have too many boxes on the shelf already. Did I summarize that correctly? Yeah. So the upstream effect is whatever you don't see on the grocery stores, it's being warehoused somewhere. Yeah. Right. And that costs a lot more money. So those that heard us on our on our last episode, we asked Bard for some help here. And um, Bard came back and said that grocery stores are making more money today than they have been before. And um, we asked it basically. Um, so I'll reread the question that we asked. I said, based on Wall Street data from Q1 and Q2 earnings, are grocery companies like Kroger, Safeway, and Albertsons seeing increased profits and also issuing better than expected guidance. And Bard says, yes, Kroger, Safeway, and Albertsons are seeing increased profits, and they are issuing better than expected guidance. And they're uh, pointing to a number of factors, including rising food prices, strong demand, and efficiency gains. And as, as a result of these factors, uh, for example, Kroger raised their guidance by 10 cents a share. Um, and Safeway also raised their guidance by about 10%, so Kroger by 11%, Safeway by 10%, and Albertsons by 14%. I think it'll be pretty interesting to ask Bard this maybe in about another quarter yeah. and see if now grocery stores are losing money or losing, you know, making less profits because they've been forced to bring prices down. Yeah, yeah, it's simple math says if your costs go up 10% and your margins grow by 12%, that extra 2% cushion is icing on the cake for grocery stores. I support it. I support it. I have long said, you keep telling me that inflation is going down and I keep going to the store and I'm not <laughs> seeing someone prices is keeping go it down. Up. Yeah, someone is, is keeping inflation high. Ridiculous. I will say I have seen more things on deep sale. So it's like, you know, 20 and 30% off for this thing. And so I, I have seen that more, but we all know that sales are a quick way of dropping prices to incent purchases. 
but it's not a long-term thing. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that from my perspective, it seems like grocery stores are hesitant to, hesitant to actually lower prices. They'd rather just run a sale to see if they can get their, get their inventory cleared out to keep prices high. Would love to see this play out uh, and would love to see grocery stores come back and help the consumers a little bit lower prices. Fingers that's crossed, enough. right? That's enough for my soapbox. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> CPI. CPI came in below expectations. Seems to be a theme today. Enlighten us, please. What happened with CPI? Yeah, this is I, this is the meat of our episode today where um, CPI came in last week. Do we timestamp? It's July 18th at 1134 Pacific. Thank you. Thank you. Um, CPI came in lower than expected. And I think it's continuing the downtrend that Chris and I have been mentioning really last summer. So inflation did peak around 10-ish percent, 9.4 percent. And there's been, it hasn't been the smoothest ride, but it's been trending down, right? Mm -hmm. And not to say it was obvious back then, but we thought it was kind of obvious back then. And <laughs> we said inventory gluts were the biggest thing. And that's playing out. The other thing that's persistent was uh, services. So what we're seeing is headline CPI is come, came in at 4.8%. And, and can, can you define what headline CPI yes. is and, and the other CPI metric for our listeners? Yes, he headline CPI is what we kind of quote as the more sticky form of CPI because it strips out volatile food and oil prices. Okay. So... That came in at four point eight percent. So that's everything, the basket of goods that's measured, stripping out food and energy. Okay. All right. Uh, headline. Headline. I quoted core before, right? So four point eight at core. Headline is three percent, which does include food and energy. So which, sorry. So you said the same thing twice. So headline includes everything, food and energy yeah. and shelter and all that other stuff. Uh, core does not include food and energy. Correct. Okay. Sorry. And core then, does not include food and energy. Headline includes everything. Yeah. And core came in at 4.8%. Okay. So your head is above your core. So your it's head. Sh not in, in this case. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just trying to, to you yeah. know, how can I remember this so that our listeners can remember, right? You know, if I'm standing, my head is above my core. So uh, headline inflation in includes everything. Everything. Uh, and my core is is below my my head, so therefore that is missing. Just remember food and energy. I don't yes. know if that helps anybody, but I'm going to try to remember it based on that. <laughs> as I yes, so yeah. uh, Chris is actually right for the most part where his head is above the core because headline typically comes in higher than core. That would make sense because it also it's includes oil. food oil. and energy. Yeah, yeah, and then when oil prices are crashing like they are. This is one of those instances, go back to 2020, where the, the price of oil bottomed out. Now, headline, which includes everything, is 3%. Is versus, less. Yeah, versus <clears throat> core at 4.8%. Again, inflation is just a measure of how fast things are moving up, right? So not to say that the price of oil is free or negative by any sense. It's just 3%. In our case, if you include it, every, everything for just really dumbing it down for my sake is gasoline is 3% more expensive than it was last year, right? Okay. It probably is cheaper. Uh, I'm in California, so it's always going to be double everyone else's price. So Same in Washington. It's yeah. been going up. Yeah, don't listen to my opinion on gas because it's totally skewed. But that's odd um, if you strip energy out Sticky inflation is looking more sticky, 4.8%. That's probably the whatever the opposite of a silver lining is, right? So the market did react to the whole CPI report pretty optimistically. It was up 2.0% last week, which is a huge jump for an That's entire index. That's a big jump. Index. It's a big week, yeah. Um, but if you're seeing inflation in terms of services, right, um, I'm pretty sure if you want to get a sofa or washer dryer, you can get one pretty quickly and very cheaply at this point, mm -hmm. relative to last year or two years ago. Mm -hmm. But it's going to 
fly. It's going to restaurants. Like we always mention, these services are persistently high, mm-hmm. and we're seeing that continue here. So I, again, I'm not uh, trying to pour cold, cold water on the the rally, but there are some underlying things that we should watch out for, and. CPI is not what the Fed looks like. They look at PCE, which is close cousin. PCE just measures what people actually buy. CPI is a fixed basket, regardless of people buy it or not. So now I got a third metric I need to re- remember. So PCE. headline is everything. Yep. At the top in my head here. Should be higher than core typically. Core. Yeah. Core in my core. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Less food and energy, and now I got to remember. PCE. Yeah, p- personal consumption expenditure. So that PCE is a little bit more accurate than CPI. So think of CPI as a basket of goods, tomatoes, washer dryers, sofas, cars. Is CPI headline or core? It's both. Bo- uh, oh, C- no. PCE. PCE could be both as well because PCE okay. strips out oil and, oil and uh, food. Okay. But CPI is a fixed basket. So if I'm not buying a car this year, CPI still measures the the Honda CRV that I'm not buying. Hmm. And if Honda's jacking up the price and no one's buying it, it still counts as inflation. On the flip side, PCE is if I am buying that Honda, yes, it's counted. But let's say I don't buy that Honda because it's too expensive, that doesn't count in PCE. So, so essentially it's counting for for decisions not made or substitution. So if I'm not buying General Mills because they're overpriced, I'm buying the white label, PCE is picking that up. Got it. Subtle difference, but it makes a big, big shift in uh, how things are being read there. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, okay, so the Fed has still said they will likely come out and raise rates but inflation numbers keep getting better so what do you what do you think they're going to do and then bold question do you think we avoided a recession or do you think it could still happen yeah so the first question is what do i think the fed's going to do i think they've already done it which was pause in june okay which one i think i'm really leery about that one pause and then resume two more hikes what are they getting in that extra month of waiting? Data. That hasn't, yeah. They're getting oh, yeah. data, the which could data, influence. Right? So, so here's what I think. They went up a lot, and they wanted to give themselves more time to digest the data to determine the path forward. Yeah. And I think in a month, in, due to seasonality and all the, these things, I don't know how much you're going to get out of uh, an extra June data versus just raising in June, raising in July, and then being done. Because mm. they, they've they always mentioned what's called this lag effect. It takes about 18 months for rate hikes to come in. Yeah. And at this point, we're only experiencing the first two or three rate hikes, which is kind of crazy, right? And if you think about it, if you're not in the, the home buying market, rates, at least from an economist's point of view, have not impacted you yet. Why do they, let's unpack that, because mortgage rates clearly have jumped sure. super fast, right? And so we know that the market prices in a lot of this stuff. You know, if the Fed raises more, that doesn't necessarily mean interest rates goes up, go up more because yeah. a lot of this is priced in. So why do they say it takes 18 months to fully impact the economy? I think, I'm going to get this wrong, but I think it's because the reason why they raise rates is the excess or surplus of money has been sloshing around. Yep. And that takes us time to wind out of the system or go back into the savings. So, so one, we have this mountain of cash because two, two or three stimulus packages from Trump and Biden mm-hmm. where we have trillions and trillions of excess surplus sloshing around. Mm-hmm. So if you raise rates, that cash isn't really reactive to that rate raising yet, at least not yet. We are seeing billions of dollars flowing into money markets, mm-hmm. but we're talking trillions of dollars that need to work its way through the system. Mm. And if you already, yeah, if you already committed 
like from a business standpoint, if you already committed an investment that's going to stretch over two, three years, you've already earmarked, let's say, $100 million for that. And it's going to be non-reactive to rate hikes. So I think an example that makes sense to me is things like mortgage rates can move up really quickly or even savings account rates can move up really quickly. So you can make kind of quick money in a savings account or yeah. potentially slow a real estate market or you know change the buying environment quickly there, which the Fed has done. But on the other side of it, you know, we talked in a previous episode about how consumers are running out of money. You know, they had savings in the yeah. pandemic, they saved money, they paid down credit card debt, and now those credit card balances are rising and their savings is coming down. That to me makes sense that rising interest rates would take more like 18 months to actually reverberate through the economy Yeah, because people have money saved that they then have to spend down before they run out and then go into more debt. And that is not like a one month thing. Correct. Okay. So yeah, that's the lag effect of why I question a pause. What are they really gleaning from what they're not seeing from inflation? And pausing or even stopping raising rates, let's say in the spring of this year, three months ago, would that have been sufficient? No one knows. And that's, that's what I was kind of alluding to with that June pause. What good did it really do? Especially when you were so persistent about getting two more hikes on the table. And if inflation really is 3%, right? Again, everyone's quoting the lower number, which is headline, which I don't think you should. Inflation really is 4.8%. And their, their target is 2%. So we're a ways away from that. But there's things baked into the CPI that I, that I have trouble squaring, like owner's equivalent rent. I, I know we've talked about that too. It's like, if you're not renting at your home, what will you rent your home for? But what if you have a really bad sense of what the market is paying mm -hmm. and you're pricing at a really high rent rate, no one's paying it, but all of a sudden it's being reflected in CPI. Yeah. Well, let's see if the uh, core can come down here. Wait a minute. I just had a thought. Since core is without food and energy, are certain elements more heavy? Do certain elements have a higher weight in that calculation? Say is, is because food is missing and let's say that that's like 10% of the number. It, are, is, are services more heavier weighted in the less food and energy? It like could be, but I, I think the denominator reflects the, the kicking out of the two industries. But yeah, I think you're, you're right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, what I was getting at there is that if this earnings call from General Mills sort of plays out and ultimately grocery stores start to lower prices, you know, potentially all of this pulls down and, and, um, you know, the, I know that the, the, the more concerning one, the one without food and energy is the higher of the two. What I just said doesn't necessarily influence that, but I do think that all of this stuff is kind of related. Yeah. Right. So hopefully, hopefully if grocery stores can re reduce prices, that can help. Correct. And then your second question is, do we, yep. do Give I me the think answer. we have a recession? I'm going to lean towards yes, still. Um, okay. I don't think you could raise rates. <clears throat> this high this quickly without something else breaking we've had a slew of regional banks failing mm -hmm. and we've mentioned high mortgage rates right i would think it really depends on the source and i'm willing to place money that if you go to a regional bank asking for a mortgage you're most likely going to experience a very high mortgage rate relative to a big bank uh, bank of america wells fargo etc and I think that's one of the big things that we're starting to see, at least initially, um, where money had been continuing to flow out of regional banks. I think this, the flows have definitely been stemmed a little bit, but that crimps their ability to lend out money. Yep. And then we mentioned uh, one of the banks that we've quoted, it was 7% up and down. Adjustable rate, jumbos, conventionals, everything was 7%. That That's a pretty explicit statement saying we do not want to do lending business right now. No kidding. Yeah. Right. So, so if you're seeing that kind of a slowdown from such an important piece of the economy, I just can't help but think that there, there is 
going to be a slowdown. Maybe we we technically hit a recession. I don't think anyone would feel it. What are your odds of recession in the next twelve months? I probably I would probably say slightly more than half, sixty percent. Sixty percent. Okay. I'm not going out on a limb there, but it, what does Goldman Sachs say? Twenty percent. And what is an average? Sixty so, percent. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> every consensus. year, every year we. Oh. Wake up Jan 1, there's always a chance that we go into recession. It's always 35%. An... Okay, thank you. Yeah. So 35%. So so Goldman Sachs is saying there is a below average chance that we go into recession. And is that in the next 12 months? Is that what their metric is? That is correct. How Dang Research is saying 60%. Yeah. And then the average is about 30. Uh, the av- so the average year in, year out with every survey economist is about 35%. This year, though, that same collection of economists is saying 60%. Ah, so that's interesting, though, because we don't go into recession one out of every three years. We go into recession one out of every six, six or seven. seven years. Yeah, yeah. Right? So the odds are always higher than the actual. Yeah. Correct. Well, fastest way to be wrong all the time, get into the forecasting business, <laughs> huh? Jeez. Yeah. Yeah, and we, you've probably heard us quote uh, 90% of economists. Do, again, there are sources from Bloomberg, CNBC that, depending on their surveys, there have been an outsized amount of recession calls early this year. And I think this dovetails nicely into the next topic, too. Yep, let's go there. Americans have not felt this good about the economy in almost two years. So we talked a few episodes ago about the Consumer Confidence Index in the stock market. Um, and what we were mainly trying to highlight there is that when consumer confidence is low or at a low, generally speaking, the subsequent 12 months of S&P 500 returns are very, very strong. So we have some data that goes all the way back to 1971, and this consumer confidence reading bounces all over. Uh, how they do this, by the way, is they call people at random. If you've ever received a call, email me. I want to know what it's I've like. I've never met a living person who's got one of those Right? Calls. I'm sure they'll never call Howard myself because we're like licensed with the SEC and registered with the SEC and stuff. And so uh, we're probably on like the do not call list for, for this. But anyway, uh, I hear what they do is they call you and they ask you like two or three questions. How do you feel about the economy, good or bad? How do you feel about you know money or your job, good or bad? And that's how they ultimately yield this consumer sentiment index. Um, anyway, when it bottoms, so since 1971, there have been nine segment troughs, uh, from that trough to the, uh, or the next 12 months after that trough, the S and P 500 has returned an average of 24.1%. You might be wondering why we still recommend to invest at the high. Sometimes consumer sentiments, sentiment is really good. So there's also been nine peaks since 1971. And uh, Ford 12-month S&P 500 returns are still positive, but by 3.5%. Still good. Okay. Um, consumer sentiment bottomed in June of 2022. And since then, the market is up 17.6%. The market, I mean, is uh, the by the market, I mean the S&P 500. This article points to how the reading jumped significantly month over month. So this is a University of Michigan survey. Uh, showed a current reading of 72.6, which is significantly higher than 65.5, which was expected. That's a 13% increase, which marks the fastest pace since December of 2005. This is when the economy was recovering from Hurricane Katrina. Sharp rise in sentiment was largely attributable to the continued slowdown in inflation, along with stability in labor markets, um, uh, according to Joanne Su who is a Surveys of Consumers Director. By the way, I'm reading a Yahoo Finance article here that posted um, uh, about four days ago. <clears throat> uh, consumers have been very bearish about the economy in the past, but now they have turned to becoming very bullish. Um, again, this is kind of like unknown on why, but strong economic data, upbeat earnings, and waning fears of a second Federal Reserve rate, rate hike in the back half of the year We'll see. <laughs> There's some other surges in business, business things. Um, 
And let's see, expectations for inflation are now at 3.4%, up from 3.3 in June, but down off the highs of 5.4 in April. Um, easing concerns of a recession. This is a quote, easing concerns of a recession, which has been garnering a ton of headlines in the media for most of the year may have helped push sentiment and expectation higher, according to o Oxford economist, chief U.S. economist Ryan Sweet. The last data point on here is uh, jobs. Jobs, cr Job creation was huge. So it says the labor market continued to show resilience with weekly jobless claims of 237,000 coming in lower than the 250,000 estimate. Um, and the economy still added 209,000 jobs. How, what do you make of all this? What do you unpack as I, as I read and kind of talk through that, that article yeah. there? Yeah. I, I should have noted what episodes we've said when sentiments is low you should probably ex have higher expectations and returns. Um, but relative to the great financial crisis, the housing crisis in 2008, sentiment was below that at the bottom, hmm. which I thought was odd. Th Pro thanks for reminding our listeners, listeners that I, I just want to point on that. So June 2022, sentiment was lower than November of 2008, August of 2011. It was... Uh, a touch lower than May of 1980, if you remember that time, and definitely lower than February of 1975. Yeah. Carry on. Sorry, I interrupted yeah. you. Yeah, 1975 was, what, 15% inflation rate? So, again, people, this survey shows that people are emotionally driven. And now just imagine the headlines today versus 1975, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and part world. of it, I think, will be um, who's, who's, who's president? Whether you're left or right, you're going to be unhappy with the other guy. So they're all oh, that's automatically about half, right? Yeah, automatically half the country is not happy with the economy, no matter what how what the data shows, right? Um, and I think it's hard to unpack emotion, and it's hard to make investments on emotion because we've oh gosh, I, countless times Chris and I say, watch out for your own emotions. But watch out for the the market's emotions, because mm -hmm. um, sometimes they over swing in, in ways that don't make sense to us. Like maybe all this AI buzz. Yeah, yeah, a little too optimistic. A little too optimistic. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's there's days or years even when it's too pessimistic. And mm -hmm. gosh. I know we have famously called the bottom of the summer of 2022 uh, to correct ourselves that the bottom was really the fall of 2022, yeah. but being We're three close. months off. Yeah. <laughs> and since that day, because I pretty, I think we called the bottom of sentiment since that day, the market's up 17.6%, right? The average is 24%. So using averages, we still have a 7% potential run up. Mm-hmm. But again, that's using averages, not not advice. There could be something that comes up that swings it the other way. And we're still cautious. We're optimistic, cautiously optimistic. But that's the problem with investing with a feeling. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it way too much where I think this should happen. I think that should happen. And I've said the market could care less about your 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 feelings about it if it's overpriced or underpriced the market doesn't care yeah and it's going to price what it's going to price i wonder if passing the passing and the the increase in the debt ceiling had anything to do with consumers obviously that took a lot of the the headlines for a, a few weeks and then yeah. you know it was passed and raised and i wonder if that sort of had an influence here and people are like feeling better because of that maybe because the media stopped writing about it because obviously yeah we pointed out the media did not highlight that there was a res resolution mm -hmm. because that's boring that doesn't generate clicks and i think a lot of it could be media driven where a lot of negative sentiment was basically compounded by writers who mm -hmm. suddenly have topics to write about hmm. all right well 
uh, we'll check in in a couple weeks on these things. This is, this is, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I'm highlighting through my, through my head, all the things that we've talked about in the past episodes and now this one. And, uh, it almost feels like we keep highlighting on similar things, but the data keeps getting more and more interesting. So we're coming back to it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> so I think, I think we've been pretty right on a lot of it. And again, we're not fortune tellers or soothsayers. It's just, we just, we just spot the trend and we're like, what do we think in the next three months, four months? Yeah. Actually in between episodes, we, we put on tinfoil hats and we try to tune in <laughs> what's going to happen, you know? And, and no, I called Jerome Powell, works. the Fed chair directly. So that's true. That's true. How has a lot of pull for those yep. that don't know. Yep. Okay. I want to end with this. So we just launched a new segment of our YouTube channel. So my question to you as a listener, are you subscribed? Are you subscribed to this as a podcast? Are you subscribed to that as a YouTube channel? If you're not search Concilia wealth on either of those platforms, anywhere that you listen to, uh, uh, podcasts we are on and on YouTube. And if you subscribe, you will see a new channel that we just launched called Concilio university. And the first couple of videos are things like how to do a backdoor Roth. Um, we just released one last Friday on how to target funds work. I know you all own target funds. How do they really work? We break that down in like four minutes. We also released some videos on umbrella insurance. What is it? How, why should you have it? These kinds of things. Um, and the, the final one so far is all about kids going to college, kids starting to drive. Should you review your insurance or how, how should your insurance look at that point? We release new videos every Friday on this playlist. So, uh, the best way to know if we have a new video is to subscribe. And these videos are targeted at two to eight minutes. Um, and they are super helpful. We've had actually fantastic, not actually, we've had fantastic feedback from them. The Roth video is currently our most viewed video on YouTube. So check it out. Shoot us They're a comment. They're so digestible too. I watch, I watch them. I'm a regular subscriber too. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. Yeah. Shoot us a like, shoot us a comment. Um, shoot us ideas. Team at conciliawealth.com. All right. Signing off for today. Thanks everyone.